littering the badlands of Montana are the fragments of a remarkable story. Curled up inside this egg is a prehistoric monster. Cracking its secrets has opened a window on the surprising world of baby dinosaurs. In the dinosaur nursery, the first moments of life were a bloody struggle to the death. In the shadow of the Rocky Mountains in western Montana, the going is tough. Scoured clean by the last ice age, the land has been stripped to bedrock. But here, in this desolate wasteland less than a hundred miles from where he was born, Jack Horner would make one of the most astonishing dinosaur discoveries of all time. Jack uncovered his first fossil when he was eight years old, but his life would change dramatically in 1978 after a routine visit to a rock shop in the small town of Bynum. He'd come to identify some bones the shop's owner, Marion Brandvold, had for sale. Jack recognized them immediately as belonging to an adult duck-billed hadrosaur, a docile 20-foot-long plant eater common throughout Montana. The fossils were nothing special, but a few other tiny fragments tucked away in a corner were. They also belonged to a duck-billed dinosaur, but this was a baby. Marion led him to the cattle ranch 15 miles west of the town of Shoto, where she'd found the bones. Here, erosion has exposed a rock-strewn desert reaching back some 75 million years to the Cretaceous period, when Montana was very different. 200 miles east of the Rockies, a vast inland sea rimmed an arid plain, crisscrossed by streams shrouded in dogwoods and ferns. This was dinosaur country. Here on this barren hillside, Jack Horner hit pay dirt. Thousands of tiny bones littered the surface, all from baby dinosaurs. Marion had discovered the bones on a little knob of green mudstone covered with pebbles. Working against time, Horner dug straight down. Within a few hours, he'd exposed something incredible, a dinosaur nest. This right here is, is what we refer to as the 1978 nest. It was the first nest found that, that, uh, that was recognized as a nest. It's, uh, it is a bowl-shaped depression where we found the remains of 15 three-foot-long babies. The discovery turned the world of dinosaurs upside down. Until Jack's discovery, all scientists knew was that dinosaurs were reptiles and, like modern crocodiles and turtles, must have laid eggs. For the next five summers, he returned to the site to look for more fossils. But the work was tedious and labor-intensive. Following a trail of broken eggshells, he and his team scoured the ground on their hands and knees, looking for fragments that were barely recognizable. Thousands of pieces later, they were able to figure out the eggs were eight inches long and oval. Eventually, Jack recovered 14 nests and 31 tiny duckbill babies, enough to raise a provocative question. Did dinosaurs care for their young? Mother duckbills laid some 20 eggs in a nest about six feet in diameter. They were arranged in a circle a few inches apart. 
Curled up inside was an embryo already taking shape. Like this embryo of a bird, baby dinosaurs absorbed the calcium from the shell to build their tiny bones, while the yolk provided nourishment. But for the youngsters to survive, they had to be kept warm. Birds incubate their eggs by sitting on them, using their body heat to maintain an even temperature. But a four-ton myosaur would turn her clutch into scrambled eggs. To overcome the problem, Jack thinks they adopted the same technique as their modern cousins. Because we find bits and fragments of plant material, and because crocodiles use that kind of vegetation, uh, we've, we're hypothesizing that they did, in fact, use some kind of vegetable material for incubation. Buried under a warm layer of vegetation, the babies grew steadily until it was time to hatch. The incubation time is a mystery, but using a computer, Horner has figured out how big a baby duckbill was when it hatched. We actually take the maximum diameter of the eggs that we find, then we reconstruct a skeleton of the baby and roll it up into a ball and stuff it into the egg, and we think that we've come pretty close to figuring out how big the hatchling is. The result was a mini monster, a foot and a half long, the size of a small domestic cat. A few hours before the eggs were ready to hatch, the first signs of life began to appear. Perhaps the tiny squeak of an infant struggling to be born. Again, Horner takes his cue from a modern reptile. A mother alligator literally turns her head to the side and puts her ear right down on the, on the nest mound and, and listens. And when she begins to hear the chirping sounds of the babies in their eggs, she then will remove the vegetation off the top. And it's certainly conceivable that the myosaurs did the same thing. They may even help their young by taking the egg in their mouths and gently breaking it. Perhaps a myosaur did the same the moment her offspring were ready to emerge. As the hatchlings struggled free, their first sight was a crowded, noisy, and violent world, alive with the squawk of newborns and parrots, and the roar of predators hungry to snatch the helpless young. Scattered across the site are 14 nests about 20 feet apart, just the size of an adult myosaur. Countless others have eroded away. Imagine an area the size of several football fields crowded with dinosaurs, the first nesting colony ever discovered. Possibly hundreds of nests, 25 to 30 feet apart. Huge nests, uh, six feet in diameter, each one. It would have been just an absolutely awesome sight. Nesting in colonies is common among birds. While mothers hunt for food, other parents can watch over the infants left home alone. Were infant dinosaurs also protected? Out of the nest, a bunch of baby myosaurs would have been meals on wheels for a carnivore. Or they could have been easily trampled by their four-ton parents. Once the babies hatched, they stayed in their nest. And they stayed, at least from the time they hatched out at a foot and a half long, until they reached about three feet long. Microscopic pollen grains from rocks found near the nests indicate mothers foraged for the tender leaves of bushes to feed their young. We have found uh, pollen and bits and pieces of twigs and so on that suggest that they were being fed uh, some kind of vegetable matter from uh, fruit-bearing plants. 
Jack Horner had brought the sights and noise of a dinosaur nursery vividly back to life. But before the dust could settle, a new, more sinister sound would echo through the colony. By the 1980s, this Montana hillside had already made history. But more surprises were in store for paleontologist Dave Riccio, a member of Horner's team since the early days. He'll never forget the day they came across a nest of eggs that were almost complete and very different. These weren't myosaur eggs. They were longer and thinner and had been laid in pairs. But who did they belong to? Luckily for Vericchio, he also found some bones. They belonged to a killer named Trudon, which means wounding tooth. A man-sized predator, Trudon was one of the most sophisticated dinosaurs alive. A swift and agile hunter with a relatively large brain, it used cunning to stalk the primeval forest. Where better to nest than close to a free meal? As work progressed, Dave found more nests. Like the plant eaters, the meat eaters formed a colony to lay their eggs. The site was christened Egg Mountain. This site here is where we recently excavated a troodon nest. And out here, in this area that's been carved out, there's been about 10 different nests collected over the last 10 or 15 years. What first struck Vericchio was the placement of the eggs. They were packed tightly together, suggesting Trudon mothers employed a different technique when tending their nests. From the tight placement of the eggs, we think that the Troodon adult actively brooded the clutch, that is, it laid upon these eggs. While myosaurs covered their nests like crocodiles, Trudons behaved more like birds. The discovery put a new spin on an old story. Lying on this nest are the bones of another egg-stealing oviraptor. It was found in 1993 by Mark Norell, near the site in Mongolia where its predecessor was first discovered 70 years ago. But this time, the eggs contained tiny bones. Analysis showed that oviraptor wasn't robbing a nest it was rearing its own. This is a snapshot in time of something which happened about 80 million years ago. It's an animal in the act of taking care of its nest, just in the way that modern birds take care of their nests today. This remarkable fossil captures the pathos of a mother defending her nest. Her arms are wrapped around the clutch to shield it from the unknown disaster about to strike. Dinosaurs like Oviraptor and Trudon were small enough to brood their eggs. But were they caring parents like the Myosaurs? In his lab, Dave Vericchio is looking into the egg of a Trudon to find the answer. Some contain the visible remains of their tiny occupants. Already, the embryo was preparing for life on the outside. In this Trudon egg, we find basically an articulated embryo, very small, uh, developing troodon, that shows very well-developed bone. So here's the, the thigh bone of a troodon. So like a crocodile or maybe a baby turkey or ostrich, those types of animals all hatch out of the eggs and are pretty much ready to go. Troodon was not only ready to go, it was ready to kill. A breakthrough in freeing embryos from the fossil shells surrounding them provided the menacing clue. It came a world away from Egg Mountain in a small laboratory in England using fossils from the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. Getting through to an embryo is complicated and risky. The eggs are hard and the bones are fragile. But Terry Manning has found a way to crack an egg without harming its contents. Inside these containers is his secret recipe, acetic acid. The acid is prepared in such a way that it only dissolves the rock around the bones and not the bones. And the amount of acid is 
that's in the bowl is quite important. So if there's too much acid, you etch too much away. You've got to keep the etching down to the minimum. At a few thousandths of an inch a day, it's a slow job, but the effort is worth it. It preserves a jumbled mass of tiny bones that are easily destroyed. When the embryo was alive, its bones were held together by its flesh. When it died and its body decayed, the bones fell apart. But even from a heap of bones, it's possible to identify a monster. This miniature claw is the clincher. It came from a raptor called Therizinosaurus that stalked the Gobi Desert at the same time its cousin, Trudon, was terrorizing Egg Mountain. Well, we can see a wonderful claw, the characteristic sickle claw, because this type of creature did have one enormous claw. While baby Trudon was sharpening its claw, it was also gnashing its teeth. Three sets in all, from harmless milk teeth to the lethal weapons of a meat eater. It's um, produced its milk teeth, which makes a cavity in the jaw. And then there's a second generation of teeth uh, come into play. And the dinosaur, or the embryo, actually loses those and develops a third set of teeth, which are very much different from the first and the second set. And that's what it hashes out with, and they're ready to go teeth, ready to eat. Its teeth sharpened, its bones fully formed, and its claw poised, Trudon is now only hours away from hatching. Back on Egg Mountain, a bloody battle for survival is about to begin. Within minutes of hatching, a newborn crocodile is on its own. The parents show little desire to care for them. Instead, the infants abandon the nest in search of their first meal. Trudon fared no better. The dead giveaway is in their nests. Unlike the eggshells of the duckbills, Trudons were almost intact. We think the animal hatched out of the upper portion, that part that was unburied, and then sort of ran off. Because the bottom portions remain really well preserved, we think that the animals left the nest shortly after hatching. With hordes of Trudons darting about looking for food, Egg Mountain was not a safe place to be, especially if you were a Myasaur baby hatching less than a mile away. Even in the nest, they were far more vulnerable than their flesh-eating neighbors. Unlike Trudon, duckbills were virtually helpless. In a world of giants, baby dinosaurs ran a gauntlet of potential disasters. Even before the duckbills were born, lizards scurried about, stealing their unattended eggs. Predators like Trudon lurked in the bushes, waiting to pick off unsuspecting victims. In the mayhem of the crowded colony, some babies were accidentally trampled. But if murder or mayhem didn't get them, there was always Mother Nature. 75 million years ago, Montana was a violent place. Some babies were overwhelmed by floods in the ebb and flow of the inland sea. Others were drowned in ash hurled from erupting volcanoes. Or they simply starved, as Ken Carpenter of the Denver Museum suspects. Say there was a drought and there was just no food for the babies. They're staying in the nest waiting for the mother to bring food to them. She never shows up. They weaken, they die in the nest. But the Myasaurs found a clever way to beat the odds. In the natural world, an elephant may produce as many as 12 offspring over a span of 40 years. In the same period of time, a duckbill dinosaur laid anywhere from 500 to 4,000 eggs. If a clutch was lost, they could produce another within the year. Those that hatched were totally dependent on their mother. To elicit her interest in child rearing, Jack Horner has an interesting theory. Baby dinosaurs actually have the same features that we see in birds and mammals. They have big eyes, they have a shortened snout, and they have a, a round head. 
what we think of as being cute. For a baby dinosaur, the primary goal in the first month or two of life was growth. Growing up fast was its final and best defense against the cruelties of the prehistoric world. Before they left the nest, the myosaurs had rapidly doubled their size. This is the bone of a baby just after it hatched. This is the same bone five years later. What I have here is the skeleton of a hatchling duckbill dinosaur. And behind me here I have an adult. You can see the enormous difference from the hatchling up to the adult size. And for example, if we look up here and compare the skulls, you can see that the skull of the baby is just so tiny compared to the adult. Duckbill dinosaurs ballooned in size, growing faster than any animal known today. They had to. Their meal ticket was about to leave. At the end of the birthing season, their mother abandoned her nest to join a herd and begin a long migration. Duckbills are the most common dinosaurs in Montana. They're also abundant in the surrounding states and into the badlands of Canada. Their bones have also been found in the barren tundra of the Arctic. In herds of up to 10,000, they migrated up and down the coastal plain foraging for plants to feed on. For the very young, growing up fast was their only hope for survival. We do know that the duckbills traveled in herds, very large herds, and they probably migrated up and down the coast of the interior seaway during the Cretaceous. If they remained small, growing at a rate comparable to alligators and crocodiles, then the little ones would never have been able to keep up during the migration. Through their sheer weight of numbers, the duckbills prevailed against the odds. From the amount of eggs they laid, to nurturing and protecting their young, their strategy was geared to success. Although the dinosaur nursery was a battleground and casualties were high, the good mother dinosaur was caring enough to ensure survival.